Allen comes from Framingham, was born in suburban Long Island. At the age of seven seemed to be significant for him, recalling that he uh, had a memorable three-month stay in post-war Europe as a child at seven, felt like he was visiting another planet and was formative for him. At this age, he also was, had access to a steel rowboat and could uh, use it as long as he stayed in the cove. And uh, that was an important part of childhood memory for him. Also, he, he remembers and feeling like it, was, uh, it had impact upon his interest in poetry, his, his mother weeping at Keats' grave. He found writing of poetry himself in high school and went on to study and continue writing and has been prolific in writing and publishing since then and has been published in many journals including the New Yorker, the Atlantic Poetry Anthologies. He has two books published, A Sail to Great Island and The Happy Genius and a number of chapbooks, some with drawings by his wife Nan Haas Feldman. He has been the recipient of a number of awards as the Elliston Book Award and the Pollock Prize for Poetry and Fellowships from Mass Artists Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. And Alan has had uh, taught at Framingham State College uh, poetry and creative writing for 37 years. And he continues teaching now poetry over at the Framingham Library uh, during the school year and in Wellfleet in the summer at the library there. And when asked for a favorite moment of sharing poetry, Alan said it. It was at commencement a while back, reading a sestina about my lovely students bent over their notebooks writing their sestinas. Thousands of people, numb by the usual graduation day rhetoric, so silent and still, listening to the odd penetration of lyrical, frankly affectionate language into an event so loaded with hackneyed, overstuffed declarations, it made me think a poem could stop a tank. <laughs> if it were good enough. Though, of course, it can't, probably. And with that, I would like to have you join me in welcoming Ellen Feldman. Each of us creates a mythology about how we came to be. And um, so as you heard, my mythology is that uh, when I was seven and my parents, after a debate, decided to bring uh, my sister and me to the Protestant cemetery in Rome because my mother wanted to see the graves of Keats and Shelley. And I stood there as a little kid and saw my mother weep over the grave of Keats that that uh, I don't know what the word is, condemned me or fated me to become a poet. I couldn't avoid it. <laughs> so uh, so th here's a poem about that. Uh, it's called Listening to Keats. I, I could be listening to the news, but I'm listening to Keats, read by some honey-tongued young British actor who, for all I know, might sound like Keats. His voice lifted in pitch by my car's tape deck running fast. I'm on a one-day news fast, if I can manage it. One Tuesday where everything that happens will have to wait till Wednesday for my response. And the Keats tape is important, mailed to me for my birthday from my daughter. She was looking at tapes at Borders and possibly recalled my wistful relationship with Keats, seeing my mother dead low these 20 years, once an English major, weeping for Keats at the English cemetery in Rome when I was seven. I could read about it even now in her letters. Keats, who sounds nothing like me, the mellifluous Keats unbothered by the whine of trucks on the Massachusetts Turnpike. Keats, who could dance his syllables to a measure while my lines are overcrowded like a mouth needing orthodontia. <laughs> For years, I wouldn't read or read about Keats, my mother's great love, now given to me by my daughter, young enough to date Keats, who's 25 at most forever. How he blazes with a love of love, youth's great initial discovery on moon-glinting St. Agnes' Eve, and feels, too, the fresh frost of early death, his brain still teeming, no chance to set it all down. 
and how he knows not to lift all his poems to some grand sentiment, but to end with an image, some forester in the cold, these poems in the porches of my ears. How my mother must have loved him since he could say what my father couldn't about a man's desperate love, a woman's merciless beauty, my father who called to chat on the day that happened to be my birthday, but couldn't just say happy birthday or didn't remember. So hey, I said it for him. I wouldn't change him or anything else at this moment except to have my daughter nearer, though I feel near to her listening to Keats, my mother, my daughter, and me, passing trucks, going through the toll booths, the dead Keats reading passionately, deathlessly. I, I was reading um, some essays by Michel de Montaigne, and I came across a, a, a little two-page essay by him on a big subject. It's called On Cities. And all he really talks about in the two pages is something that his, that his father once said to him. His father said that, now we're talking about a contemporary of Shakespeare's, you know, late 1500s. His father once said to him, it would be really great, uh, the cities are great, but it would be really even better if there was a place in cities where people who uh, needed things could meet up somehow with people who would be willing to supply those things. And I thought, oh my God, he anticipated by 400 years the invention of the World Wide Web. Um, so, so this is a, a poem called Watch Battery. <laughs> who knows if my father ever thought what Montaigne's father did, that every city should have a place where people who are in need could go to meet. How somewhere a man is starving, and another with a surplus would grieve if he only knew and offer the man a modest but reasonable living. That giving man could have been my father, not grieving perhaps, but regretful he couldn't be of more help, a man you could trust to fix things. Like the man who helped the watchmaker fix my watch, how when he couldn't decide how to loosen the clasp that holds the battery, itself no bigger than a small coin without breaking it, he turned to someone more experienced, a Dutchman actually, who seemed happy to demonstrate this very skill and upload it to YouTube. <laughs> demonstrate it with a camera in his lap so we could see his two hands familiarly competently and rapidly, opening the watch to replace the battery, the way a father would automatically retie his son's shoe. And there was also his calm voice with its accent, like the woodcarvers in Pinocchio, telling the confused and despairing who were ready to lose patience and snap the band holding the battery and ruin the watch, the watch that could keep running, how to prolong its life by exercising patience the very quality my dad had in abundance, that quality I always loved him for, of solving the problem without getting exasperated. Though it's unfair, he never had parents like that himself, or that when the amount of pain rose to be greater than any pleasure he'd be able to feel, the little watch-sized defibrillator in his heart wouldn't simply stop and let him go. Well, as you heard, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to live with an artist who um, fills the house uh, and my life with color. Um, so um, uh, here's another uh, poem from, from uh, A Sail to Great Island uh, called Grayness. At home, Nan and her friend Joni are drawing in our kitchen. I'm going to live, I tell them. These aren't lymph nodes. It's not lymphoma. These are nothing but submaxillary salivary glands. 
how could my doctor not know? How dumb would you have to be in my field? This might be a Shakespearean sonnet, but I'll have to send you to a specialist. <laughs> this gets a laugh, and since I'm going to live, I make myself lunch. It's not like the body keeps changing its mind about where things are. It's anatomy. The ENT doc felt my neck once. Yes, yes, they agree. Their drawings spread colorfully over large sheets of white. Anything can be included. The light fixture, my yellow coat I wear when sailing on gray days. Suddenly, this vast future, like the sea, unfolds, and I have to cross it. I have to drink more fluids. <laughs> Otherwise, I can work on a poem. I don't need to be part of this conversation. With a mind like mine, I can imagine people might begin to call me brave, the horizon shrinking in little increments to the railings of a special bed. I'll start with my thoughts driving home from the clinic my death revoked. The pond's still here, and the road, also gray, precious with traffic. And then in the kitchen, two women with their bright drawings, talking. Well, as you undoubtedly know, uh, we've been something that now is called, or we are going through something that now is called the the Great Recession. <laughs> but when it was really, really, really starting to unfold, everybody was afraid that it was a replay of the Great Depression. So I started to think about the Great Depression. I didn't live through that, but as a child, I always heard the term and I lived with people who had lived through it. And I got to wondering whether during the Great Depression, everybody walked around depressed. And then I guess I heard a guy talking on the, the radio about his memories of that time. And um, so I decided to write a poem called The Secret History of Elation. In such unprecedented times, with a scream slicing through the air, like one of those saws that cut stone, it is worth asking whether we can discover a secret history of elation. I offer you the couple celebrating their 65th. He remembers making $12 a week and spending $6.50 on their dinner at the Roosevelt Hotel. The point of this illustration, though, is the $2 tip, such generosity. We can well imagine the sound of her buttocks smacking against his thighs, both before and after dinner. <laughs> and what was the weather? Sunny, at least inside them. He came to town with almost two years' salary and spent it. And sometimes the actual weather was manic. But was the traffic depressed? No, it rolled down the avenue eagerly, rejoicing in its new lightness. Even the depressed felt near to normal, if not privileged, having timed the market so that when happiness declined, they were ready, hedged against panic. Therefore, to learn from the past, we must search out the corners of pleasure in the church of mind over matter. The sun on the bar stool set out on the sidewalk in front of the Rue Morgue lounge. Or the magnificent black cloud, though it did kill most of the winter wheat. And the old couple from the Roosevelt Hotel, with those years of sadness behind them when the bar graphs drooped like icicles and they hit the streets to call for justice they believed would overwhelm the world. They will rise again, disguised in jeans and stocking caps and parkas, but identifiable by their ruddy cheeks 
and the way they smile and never get cold. Now I'll go way back um, to, um, you know, one of those uh, little poems that you might write and you don't think much of it at the time. But then years later you, you reread it and you say, wow, if I hadn't written that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even begin to remember that that moment or that event had happened. And um, so this is a poem about one of those moments that would have been entirely forgotten if I hadn't written it down. So it's preserved here like a kind of fly in amber. Um, the the um, poem is really an example of something that Frank O'Hara used to call his I do this, I do that poems. Um, he was a busy curator. He used to um, only have time to write during his lunch hour. Um, so this and that would happen during the, the day and he would then write a poem at lunch saying all the things that had happened leading up to some moment of feeling that he had. So that's a poem, if you write poetry, that's a poem you could write every day of your life. Anyway, this one is called The Quiet Years of Ordinary Objects. This pretty maternity blouse, for example, 1695 with pastel embroidered flowers around the neck, washable. I pass it while heading for Botolf's, where they sell expensive arty jewelry. But nothing I haven't already given you, except a hand silk screen card with a pastel rainbow and a pale yellow sun. Back at the stork shop, the salesgirl and I speculate on your probable size. Her first, she asks? No, second. She gives me the blouse in a bag. Later, at home, with you off to evening class, the afternoon sun in silver pajamas, our daughter bathed and singing herself to sleep. I find a gift box from Gilchrist in the closet pack it with tissue paper, fold the blouse carefully with the rainbow card on top, and write something shamelessly corny, like, for my sunlight, my rainbow, happy birthday, and sign it Alan, though we're beyond names. I'm going to close with um, a poem that's a little bit like that. Um, it's, uh, it's called In November, and actually it was written right in um, uh, the workshop that I give at the Framingham Library um, uh, very quickly, just about something that had happened uh, uh, recently during the day, and it kind of closes a circle because the baby in silver pajamas that's mentioned um, in that poem that I just read is um, my daughter in, in, in this poem. It's called In November. When my daughter calls and I can hear her baby crying in the back seat and she asks, Dad, would you mind if I stop by for a quick diaper change and feeding? I'm so glad I picked up the phone. Glad I hadn't set off on my walk. And quite soon, I see her car rolling into the driveway, and the baby is stretching open her little mouth and wailing as babies do. So enraging not to be able to speak, not even to be able to think this or that is wrong, except that the whole universe is wrong. <laughs> and when they're settled in the little bedroom off the kitchen, and the baby is sucking noisily and then contented once more, rolling both eyes, not always in the same direction. <laughs> Mother and baby in the bedroom where my daughter herself was once diapered and fed. I feel so thankful for never having strayed very far into the wide world, never having served in the foreign wars of my time, and grief for fathers who do, the ones swaddled in flags. Maybe because yesterday was Veterans Day, 
And though she says she's never done this before, my daughter tells me she called up a soldier's family she knew just to say she'd been thinking of them, just hoping the war we have now will end soon. And the thin November light is straining through the window curtains we've never changed. And I feel thankful for my many years right here in this house, the way I imagine a tree might feel thankful if it were ever given the opportunity to roam around the world. How it might say, so good of you, but no thank you. Where would the birds be without me here? The ones that fly back unpredictably and perch in my hair this and every November, my thinning hair. Thank you. Portrait of a boy with mother and Asperger's. Blonde boy, bear of a boy, teddy bear boy, fleecy, golden-haired boy, big for his age, 11-year-old boy, sharp, vocabulary, stories to nowhere boy. Might life be a cartoon boy? Boy monster, a hole where citizenship would be. No room for society, blind to respect. Boy with mother, love hug, bear hug, bear hug with a bear of a boy and a slant of a mom. Both blonde, fleecy blonde, Hair sways, swings, waves, a yellow trance. The bear hug, bear boy dance. A vague semblance of happiness. A mother waltz, the bear boy's best. Weakly coupled, but off sprung, off kilter, imbalanced, momentum stirred. Boy with mother holds on for dear cracked life. Sugared up, not all spice, not all nice. Boy with mother wrapped in his steps. Fear his wrath, bear this fragile filament. Spin, spin. And this last one um, is new, relatively, and it's called addressing what's broken. I wish I were good with tools so that when the stove timer can't keep time anymore, I would know just how to pull off the knob and recoil the spring or set it straight just so, so that when I turn the knob, I can depend on the ticking away of minutes, the quiet panting, until the annoying mechanical buzz saws against the silence. I wish, too, I could find my refrigerator model number <laughs> and know how to replace the door gasket when it arrives. I am good with duct tape for now. The tape holds the two doors kissing when magnets no longer attract and I have no one I can call anymore who is good with tools. Bill Evans, jazz pianist. On the eve of genetic engineering, Bill Evans died. And with him flew a subtlety. I'm sure that perfect pitch will click down generations like egrets on an escalator, 
a white death stitch. We can do it. Didn't Hobart solve thin slicing for the late night deli? I think that we'll clone anything per se, except phrasing. It's just jelly. No more Evans, baby. He's gone east. Feather-fingered bass notes over Sheep's Head Bay. One more subtlety on the way. Whether it's infectious disease, severe weather, or a chemical spill, emergencies that threaten our public health can happen at any time. After the events of 9-11, the federal government established the Medical Reserve Corps to respond to emergencies. Today in the Commonwealth, 45 Corps units recruit and train both medical and non-medical volunteers. In addition, the Department of Public Health's MSAR program, or Massachusetts System for Advanced Registration, credentials and deploys healthcare professionals to respond in such emergencies. Now a new effort is underway to enhance emergency response by aligning the activities of both groups. Mass Response is designed to facilitate emergency medical response and promote local partnerships in planning and assistance. And you, health professionals and concerned citizens alike, can be part of this important effort. For more information on Mass Response and how to get involved, visit maresponse.org.